Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the final episode of Brooklyn Historical Society's Bite Size History, Lunch with the BHS Collections. For the past five weeks, every Friday at lunchtime, we have dug into one object in our collection, uncovering the many histories a single item can tell and their connections to life in Brooklyn and Long Island. Um, I'm Nayeli Guillen. I am historian and project manager of BHS's Revealing Long Island History Project. I've been your bite-sized history host and history detective. Um, as always, we wanna send a big shout out to the Robert D.L. Gardner Foundation, whose generous support of the Brooklyn Historical Society has made our Revealing Long Island History Project and this web series possible. We're wrapping up this week by discussing one of Brooklyn Historical Society's newest acquisitions, an amazing Dutch language land deed signed by New Amsterdam Governor William Kieft in 1643 granting land in what is today Southern Brooklyn to a man named Anthony Van Sally, the first known man of Muslim origin in America. I'm so grateful to be joined once again this week by my former BHS colleague and current curator of history, social science, and government information at the New York Public Library, Dr. Julie Golia. Hey, Julie. Hi, Nayeli. Great to be back. It's so nice to have you. Um, just a reminder to everyone before we get started, if you've missed any episodes of Bite Size History from earlier this summer, you can still watch them. Um, recordings are available in past events, uh, sorry, in the past events page of the BHS website. So um, please do go and check those out. Um, and also, um, one more time, we welcome your questions and queries throughout the program. Just type them into the Q&A box below um, and Julie and I will take as many as we can towards the end of our time. So good to go, Julie, should we get started? Let's get started, I'm excited. All right, me too. Um, can we get the first slide, please? Um, Julie, so one thing that's fabulous about having you here again with us this week is that we can bridge the end of our conversation from last week into this week. Um, this was one of our final slides from episode four, um, this wonderful cart to the seat of a young African-American boy um, taken in Williamsburg. Um, as you mentioned, one of the only Civil War era photographs in the BHS collection that represents um, local African-American history or stories. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, yeah, we were talking about the kind of the the stories that were in the archives and the stories that were not in the archives and how it's a lot harder to tell the stories of people who aren't represented in the archives. And I would say um, in this in this sort of particular topic of sort of black faces in the collection was one, but it's not the only one. This is something that exists to every library, every collection. Um, and one of the big holes was uh, chronicling the really rich history of Muslims in Brooklyn. Um, both in like the 20th and 21st century, which is an incredibly diverse history, but then even going back to, you know, 19th, 18th, even 17th century Brooklyn as well. Absolutely. Um, why don't we pop to the next slide? Um, because I know, uh, Julie, that one way that we have started to sort of fill that gap in the BHS collection has been through um, BHS's incredibly rich oral history collections. This is a really important part of the history of Brooklyn Historical Society, right? Um, so in the 1970s, recognizing the growing, though not new, diversity of the borough of Brooklyn, um, the curators before Nayeli and I um, thought about ways of di both diversifying the collection and I think allowing um, different groups to tell stories in their own voices, right? So to prioritize these histories from the perspective of those people who experienced them. In 1973, um, BHS launched the Puerto Rican Oral History Collection. There are voices in there of people who were born in the 1880s in Brooklyn. So it's like an unbelievable resource. And so when it came time to think about um, chronicling the history of Muslim people collection, in the collection, um, one important asset that we had was Zahir Ali, who was our oral historian at the time and an incredible scholar of American Muslim experiences. And he really spearheaded this project in which we were able to bring into the collection 54 oral histories from such a sort of a like a heterogeneous group of people. Um, diversity in terms of race, in terms of country of origin, um, and also in terms of spiritual sort of um, differences and even spiritual experiences. So there are people who are devout Muslims, there are people who identified as Muslim who were largely not practicing and everything in between. 
Um, happily, everyone can kind of go and dig into these at our oral history portal, which Nayeli has um, included the URL to and the landing page to, to hear more about this really wonderful collection. And one thing, having all of these um, oral histories now and, you know, really being able to tell um, this kind of contemporary history has made the fact that um, there was such a dearth of information about the earlier period and, um, and Muslims in Brooklyn who lived here in centuries prior, it made that all the more obvious. So um, when this, um, why don't we pop to the next slide, when this particular artifact kind of um, came across your desktop, Julie, I know um, you are incredibly um, excited about the possibility of bringing this to BHS. Yeah, I mean, and this is some something that I mean, the down the you know the the downside of oral history is that we can't tell you know 18th century and 17th century stories unless we have some like extremely strong spelling salts, right? Um, so, and it was uh, for the for fans of um, for fans of um, Flatbush and Maine, our our, our old podcast, um, some of the more interesting but trickiest um, sort of episodes to bring in the oral history collection were on topics like with the Revolutionary War, you know, we don't have oral histories on that topic. Um, and so there always continued this question of how to, how to draw that Muslim history back in time, um, back earlier than, um, than the, the beginning of the 20th century. And that's the sort of serendipitous moment when an auction listing came into my inbox. Um, <laughs> from a colleague actually at the place that I work now at New York Historical, <laughs> I mean New York Historical, New York uh, Public Library, um, who um, was the curator of manuscripts at the time. He's no longer there. And he said, you know, I just wanted to give you a heads up. And um, did you know this was coming to auction? And I didn't because um, at BHS, we have, you know, an acquisition budget um, of zero dollars. <laughs> and so we don't really follow auctions. We're often relying on donations um, to be able to um, take collections in. So um, I was getting more and more interested as I explored the listing for this land deed. It was um, signed by Director General, who was essentially like the governor of New, of New Amsterdam, or, of New York at that time, um, William, K no, sorry, New Amsterdam, William <laughs> Kieft. Um, and it was granting land in what is today Brooklyn to a man named Anthony Jansen Van Sally. The Van Sally is essentially from Sale, the, the town of Sale, which is in present day um, Morocco. Um, and he's also referred to um, in records as Anthony the Turk, right? And a little bit of digging essentially showed him to be what we think is probably the first person of Muslim origin living in what is today the United States. And certainly this was the first um, exchange of land between a person of Muslim origin in the Americas at the time. So this was something that I knew, both given our collections um, in 17th century land deeds and given our commitment to collecting Muslim history, we had to have this document. <laughs> but, but how? <laughs> <laughs> Um, and we are incredibly grateful that you were able to, to hook up with the Breslauer Foundation to, to really get the, the uh, finances in line to bring this to BHS. It was a kind of banner moment for us, you know, New it York Times. It was absolutely it, a coup. It was a coup. The Breslauer Foundation <laughs> is this amazing organization that exists largely to help institutions acquire the documents that they really, really should have, like that this is the right place for it to live. So we wrote up a very, you know, a quick and dirty historical brief on this and why we should have it, <laughs> sent it over to the Breslauer Foundation who got back to us in less than a day saying, <laughs> yes, we've got, you need to have this, we've got you, and essentially underwrote our ability to acquire it at, at the auction that took place at Christie's a few days later. Right. Um, and it's amazing now to have it at BHS because it really, it's incredibly special, but also it's a, an item that really does fit into the sort of the unique nature of BHS's manuscript collections. Um, as you mentioned, Julie, we do have um, a sort of wonderful plethora of um, historic land deeds going back to the 17th century that really do document um, the, the ownership and transfer of land from, you know, Western Long Island, what is today Brooklyn, all the way out to the East End. Um, but the, the individual who is involved in this particular land transaction makes this item that much more special. Um, for individuals who are, you know, with us watching, um, maybe on a, a laptop screen, 
Um, I, I know the the document looks relatively small, and it is um, mm -hmm. really small. It's prob it's more likely um, than not smaller than the screen that you're looking at it um, at, on. Um, and it is written in a very small 17th century Dutch script. Um, if there are any Dutch readers out there, um, if you were able to get a good close look at this, it probably would be something that would stump you um, even today because 17th century um, Dutch writing is um, fairly different from, from what that language has evolved to today. Um, and you can see that I, I have put up a sort of partial transcription of what um, is on this document. And you can see that it is, um, pretty well detailed. Um, it is um, Willem Kieft um, granting land the 1st of August, 1679, 100 Morgans of land lying on the Bay of the North River upon Long Island opposite Kanyan Island, Coney Island. Um, and the thing about land deeds is that they are um, absolutely, they're legal documents. They are contracts um, that are documenting a transaction. And from that perspective, they can be a little bit kind of, you know, mind-numbing to read <laughs> because they are very um they're very um specific they're very detailed in what they're saying you can see all of those different rods there it's laying out exactly where this land was um based on that land there opposite the north river um and even though they're a bit and i was going to say it's, it's before gps before latitudes mm -hmm. and longitudes and so a lot of the descriptions in these are like take a left at the stone wall, you know, um, walk five paces. Um, so it really, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a scale of land description that it seems bizarre to us today, mm -hmm. uh, but actually was very, very interesting to some of the genealogists who were mapping these things mm -hmm. out as Brooklyn was shifting from being a much more rural place in the 19th century to one that was more built out. Um, we can absolutely see um, uh, sort of, amazing insights into this early period of contact and, and European settlement on Long Island, um, sometimes down to the, um, you know, the acre, half acre, whatever it is. Um, some eagle-eyed folks that are looking at the screen might notice a slight um, date discrepancy on here. The, the transcription does say um, August 1639, but the date on the land deed is 1643. And, and you and I, Julie, have kind of postulated about um, that and it does have to do most likely with um, the sort of legal nature of this document, right? Yeah, I mean, I I think it's you're you're exactly right to think about these kind of workhorse documents. That these are um, these are things that were copied and recopied. There was an industry of of government scribes essentially whose job it was to copy these things. Um, so we have no other evidence of an existence of an identical copy of this, but it, it, it likely existed, right? Like there were likely multiple copies of this. Um, this was probably written at a slightly later date um, as a record um, for somebody of the, the actual, the nature of the land grant itself. So I think that is like, you know, we don't know for sure. And that there's so many things as we're gonna see that we don't know for sure about this document. But I think it's fair to speculate that while the land um, sort of provision took place in um, 39, that it's completely appropriate. It makes sense that this document might have been created a little bit further after that. Absolutely. Um, let's, um, let's put up uh, the next slide to get a bit um, away from the rods and rods to give people a bit more of a sense of what we're actually talking about. Um, I know when we think Coney Island today, right, it's very much amusement parks and, and hot dogs, but um, the world of, you know, Southern Brooklyn uh, was very different um, when Anthony Van Sally was here and, and in 1639 when this um, amazing map from the Library of Congress um, uh, dates to. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I think I, we associate, you know, like if you're in Coney Island today, you can hop on the nice fast Q train and head right <laughs> into lower Manhattan. Um, but I think it's really helpful for people to think about um, colonial Brooklyn as something of a frontier. Um, it, and it's actually language that, is then, that was later sort of repurposed in the 20th century in terms of gentrification and whatnot. But I mean, it, these were truly unsettled lands. And, but I take you to say that with an enormous caveat in the fact, fact that they were not unsettled. There were right. uh, a number of Native American tribes who were living in this area. And that is sort of another very un, even less documented uh, part of the story of these land transactions. Um, at the time, but it was um, it was 
um, rugged land. The Native Americans who lived there were largely nomadic and they didn't uh, do an extensive amount of settling or clearing of the land. Um, it would have taken somebody on the land in what was New Utrecht Gravesend where um, that was granted to Van Sally, uh, you know, days perhaps right. even to get to the ferry in what we now know is Brooklyn, called Brooklyn Heights, to actually get across the, the, uh, the river to the city. So in some ways, as we're gonna see with, with, um, with Anthony's story, um, a frontier offered opportunity. And right. in, from another perspective, it also offered essentially banishment, um, which is the kind of the legal milieu in which um, he moved to Brooklyn. Absolutely. Um, circled on the map in blue, right, is what we could think of as kind of the big city, right? New Amsterdam, which even itself was young because uh, settlers hadn't really started establishing a, a permanent settlement there um, until 1624. So it's maybe just a decade or so prior um, to Van Sally's getting the land in southern Brooklyn, um, which is where the little red circle is. So he might have um, taken a ferry, he might have taken um, you know, if he wanted to go kind of around the narrows there, but absolutely, it, it's um, uh, a faraway place. I mean, even for people that are going from lower Manhattan to Coney Island today, it feels like a trek. So even much worse when you didn't have that lovely um, now, before, mass transit system set in. <laughs> we should remember that he moves in the end of the 1630s. Um, right. He actually arrived in New Amsterdam in 1630. He was quite young. He was in his 20s. Right. Uh, recently married, he had married a um, a German woman um, named Greet Rainers. Um, it likely in Amsterdam before they got on the boat to come over to uh, to the colony. So right. they were among some of the earliest settlers here, and actually established a farm um, on sort of the edge, the outskirts of town, a little bit near where Wall Street was, um, because that was Wall Street was the northern boundary of of New Amsterdam at the time, which gives people, I think, a sense of how Right. small uh the city was at the time but uh, I, he was a, he was a a new amsterdam resident for almost a decade um before right. you know before he he acquires this land under um some scandalous circumstances which we're going right. to tell people about in a moment but i think it's 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 important to think of him his you know um his mother was um called of Moorish origin. Um, his father was Dutch, but according to some records, converted to Islam and then became part of the Barbary pirates, essentially. Um, <laughs> and so, and they lived in Saleh, um, which as I said, is part of sort of Morocco, the Moroccan coast. They lived in Algiers, and then they moved to Amsterdam. This is a very sort of a classic, um, so almost cosmopolitan family that is part of this transatlantic culture that exists, where you see the exchange of, of course, people in the context of slavery, cultures, languages, religions, an enormous amount of mixing um, is going on. And so it makes total sense that Anthony Van Sally would have moved to all of these different cities around the Atlantic world, and then eventually settled in this kind of outskirts of a city, right. perhaps, you know, with his new wife to make his own way in the world. Um, can we pop to the next slide? We can get a, a, a draw an image, but an There's image of city. that little, of that big city. <laughs> um, you know, a couple hundred people maybe when, uh, when Van Sally arrived here in 1630. Um, but as you said, Julie, a place that um, was much more diverse than we give it credit for, right? It wasn't just, um, Dutch people. There were people here from Germany, from France, um, from Northern Europe, from um, uh, Northern Denmark Africa. and Sweden, Northern yep. Africa. Mm -hmm. um, something like 18 different European languages um, spoken in New Amsterdam and very much a place of, of um, mercantile business. So it was um, a trade outpost. And I think that's, in, and people lived there, but many people were passing through the economy very much catered to that. And so I think it is important to think, you know, we sent to center of the Americas, but this was just sort of one tiny outpost in a larger Atlantic world. Right. Um, so when he came here, you know, he did, he established his farm, he had his family in um, lower Manhattan and over the course of that first decade he did make his way in this new world but potentially not um, under the circumstances that he might have anticipated. I know Julie you did 
um, when you know the deed popped up a lot of digging and in the records that do still exist the the company records um, and found a rather um, dramatic scandalous story kind of documented there if we can pop to the next slide um, maybe we can we can talk about Anthony and Greet's uh, relationship with their their neighbors yeah so I think there's like an overarching question here which is sort of how much did um, Anthony Vanzelli's mixed race um, sort of uh, identity shape his experiences in, in New Amsterdam. Um, and actually, I will just like kind of add to that, um, his very, a woman who was clearly a very outspoken wife and partner in the world. And so in a way they had these kind of two um, like strikes against them, if you will. And they're coming into a, a small town, one that is sort of, even though there was significant religious religious freedom shaped by the cult, you know, the sort of Dutch cultures and practices, including the Dutch reformed church. Right. Um, and also a place that was very much shaped by sort of gossip and accusation and scandal. And so that's a little context around what happened with them. But essentially, um, clearly Anthony Van Sally owed certain people money. One of them was a very powerful uh, minister named Domini Bogardus. Um, he brought him, he brought Van Sally to court. Van Sally pushed back on it. Um, and then at some point, Greet be, sort of becomes involved accusing the Domini's wife of doing something scandalous, which is that she lifted her skirts in the street to possibly <laughs> expose her ankle, essentially accusing her of being like a whore, a prostitute, right? And then Domini Bogardus comes back sort of saying, no, 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 actually, you're the whore. <laughs> Right. You are sort of the, here, the language, um, the whore of the, um, of the rabble's whore. Um, and basically, um, you have this back and forth of words. Most of the citizens come to support the powerful church leader. And after a series of heated legal exchanges, essentially, Governor Kiev throws up his hand and says, I'm going to have to call this against the Van Sally family. Um, banishing them essentially from New Amsterdam, but giving them time to A, sell off their farm um, on the northern outskirts of the city, but then B, somehow, and then again, this is part of the story that we don't know, then Sally has enough sort of capital to arrange to be gifted um, the significant mm -hmm. portion of land, again, along the frontier of um, southern Brooklyn. I was thinking about this because I, I was poking um, the the image that you see on the screen is is a uh, the Dutch colonial council minutes that do still exist in in Albany in the New York State Archives, um, and blessedly they have been amazingly transcribed, um, and are now keyword searchable. And, and because um, Anthony and Greet's names are kind of have several different um, variations, I've just been doing different keyword searches to try to bring different things up. Um, and you can see every single time they're sort of pulled in and how the community kind of ganged up against them um, and really kind of um, uh, dragged their reputations through the mud. Um, but uh, it really is a sort of funny question as to how that happened. I mean, in that time period, the end of the 1630s into the 1640s, there was also a great deal of, of strife with um, the indigenous communities that were living in the region, you know, Kiev's war when he kind of indiscriminately went to war against those communities. So it was incredibly unstable it might, and it might have been um, a better solution in his mind to send settlers out that way who might help ease the tension rather than sending them away entirely. I think that's actually a really smart conjecture um, that it, it, in a way he was able to uh, sort of um, garner the manpower of this person who had otherwise been banished um, right. toward an end, which by the way, Kiev's war is in the early 1640s, right? So it's like right mm -hmm. when this is happening. And though much of that took place to the north on the island of Manhattan, there were certainly these kinds of skirmishes um, in, in, in Brooklyn as well. Interestingly, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Nile, because if I recall correctly, there is no mention of Native Americans in the in the land deed um in the translation mm -hmm. of the land deed which in some for some other land deeds you do see an exchange right. sometimes between native american leaders sometimes you see their mark 
Um, so, and and in, in this particular case, we don't see anything. Now we do know that Canarsi um, Indians lived near the Coney Island area, and certainly it was a part of their kind of sort of nomadic path or their, their seasonal path. And so it's not like they, he was going to sort of untouched land. But I think that that kind of um, political savvy or that you know, sort of political decision making by Kiev makes perfect sense to me. Mm -hmm. Um, why don't we, let's pop to the next slide just so we can again sort of get a, a kind of close up the blessed, uh, wonderful nature of that um, deed and the fact that we can kind of carve out an understanding of where exactly he was going. Um, the little close up there. Um, this is a, a later map, a much later map from the 1800s in the VHS collection, um, but one where um, Tunis Bergen, who was a surveyor in Brooklyn at the time, he's kind of gone in and really um, kind of recreated where exactly um, this region was um, for Anthony and Greet. Um, right on the bay, you can see Coney Island sort of sticking out um, a bit there. I know, Julie, we had a fun back and forth about this map when we were talking about it earlier we this like, week. We were like this. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, it, you know, removed far away, but a decent chunk of land for him and um, a place of opportunity, as you said. If we can, um, we can come back to this if you'd like, but we, can we pop forward one more, um, Bo? Um, it's maybe slightly difficult to see here, but this is another map that is um, in Albany from the 17th century. Um, the red circle um, is um, the Van Sallies land and the blue one is um, the gridded outline of Gravesend, um, which was one of the early colonial towns that was settled in Western Long Island. Um, and one of the only, the only one in fact, um, in what is today Brooklyn that was settled by an English person, not a Dutch person, um, and by a woman. Um, so there's this kind and of another lovely, vanished person, another person an, vanished from somewhere um, and there's this, you the frontier, right? There's this like beautiful confluence between the Vansalis and um, Lady Deborah Moody because they did, they had the same kind of um, sort of difficulties with the sort of Puritan colonial um, system that existed and they sort of found new opportunities for themselves um, on this far frontier. Um, we had a question um, earlier this week from um, uh, from a, a, a BHS person who we both know about his relationship with, or Anthony's relationship with Deborah Moody. And um, that's why I was in the records a bit. And I didn't find anything specifically about her and Anthony. Um, but I did find something about Henry Moody, her son, hmm. um, dragging Anthony into court. So it seems in the 1650s, Anthony Van Sally continued to have um, legal issues um, with his neighbors. Um, he also got thrown into jail at Gravesend at one point for some reason that I can't, is not completely clear in those records. But um, in thinking about these two communities, Lady Deborah Moody and particularly Greet, um, uh, you know, we can kind of see a moment where we have this opportunity to kind of rewrite history and think about the history that has been um, kind of put down um, about these early kind of rabble some women. Well, and I think, you know, one of the reasons we know about them is because both of these uh, people, both, um, both Deborah Moody and then Anthony and Greet um, were successful, right? Mm -hmm. So there's probably, you know, um, countless numbers of uh, banished people who actually didn't were able to establish themselves or got killed on the frontier or just right. packed up and went back to, um, to Europe or, you know, perhaps indentured themselves to somebody else. You know, there's a million other paths that they could have gone, but you know, the, the, the Van Sallies, um, established a rather prosperous farm at the time, which then they're able to leverage and sell, um, to, I believe Nicholas Stillwell, Mm -hmm. um, there's a whole record of this that actually in the previous map, if anybody ever gets to come back into the archives and take a look at this in very small handwriting, Tunis Bergen, yeah. you can see that tiny handwriting, <laughs> Tunis Bergen has indicated who the land was passed to over and over and over and over again. And then despite his lifetime banishment, at the very end of his life, after Greet's death, um, Van Sally um, rids himself of all of his land and then moves back to New Amsterdam, right? So the, <laughs> the memory did not, um, Clearly, you know, the record of banishment did not get passed along in the, in the handover from um, New Amsterdam <laughs> to New York at the time. But I mean, it, it perhaps like the most significant or sort of cultural accomplishment is that 
like anybody who traces their roots back to 17th century Brooklyn claims ancestry with um, with the with with Anthony Van Sally and with Greet. And I think um, you know the Vanderbilts did. You know, I mean, this is some of the biggest names of people. Um, you know, trace their ancestry back to them. They were they had four daughters. They were able to marry them off very successfully to sort of wealthy Brooklyn merchants at the time. And, the, and they both die having really established their family and established themselves as sort of the foremother and forefather of what would later become the borough of Brooklyn, which is a pretty remarkable success story considering, you know, considering what they had faced um, in 1639. Right. It's fascinating. It's a it's incredible and you know not the sort of story that you um anticipate finding is kind of the joys of genealogy it's sometimes not a norm. Kind of what pops up <laughs> yeah i think that is actually a really important point that this is a this is a fascinating story because it is it is an outstanding story it's like very much outside the norm um this is not for, for example if we want to draw this back to muslim history this is not the typical story of muslims coming to brooklyn in the 17th century. That story is a story about enslaved people coming from West Africa, from, communi from communities in West Africa who either were practicing Muslim or were sort of steeped in, a, in Muslim culture, bringing over practices, uh, bringing over traditions and languages. That is a story, the, the more common story of um, the experience of the transfer of Muslim culture to the new world and one that, of course, we have almost no, no right. written record of. And in fact, the very few records that we do have that are of graves, right? Mm -hmm. Of, you know, for example, at the African burial ground, of uh, exhuming graves and findings, people buried with things, um, so people buried in the direction of Mecca. That is the only mm -hmm. evidence that we really have of that experience. Right. Um, let me think. Um, so let's pop two slides forward, if you don't mind, just to make sure that we kind of um, cover it and all. Um, because women's history kind of has this same kind of trajectory, right? Women are very easy to sort of lose um, in the narrative of history of, you know, the sort of accomplishments of great men. Um, and one way that the story is even that much more remarkable is that we have information on Greet and that Greet's own story is one that we are continuing to sort of revise and rethink about um, as we continue to sort of prod at their history. Yeah, I will say that as I started to do the research around this land grant, and again, it was just preliminary research, um, it, somebody needs to dig very deeply and sort of commit, of course, like a moment of their career to this topic because <laughs> it's fascinating. Um, it, Greet emerged as this really fascinating and clearly like somebody who became almost mythic in status sort of figure in the story. Um, very prominent historians have just accepted some of these ideas um, without questioning them. There was sort of something that has been traded and discussed a lot is like that she was somehow like the, the concubine of a different governor, Wouter Van Twiller, that she came over sort of like with him um, as his lover. Like the right. records show very clearly that she married Van Sally in Amsterdam and that they almost immediately after getting married got on the boat together and came over. That is what the, that is what the historical record shows. Um, but these things get, I think in part because people don't read Dutch or people, it's very difficult to do the primary research around this topic. Right. People read secondary sources and these things get passed along. Greet actually was even taken as kind of a historical figure in a, in a, um, in a historical fiction book about, um, the, about New Amsterdam and was portrayed as like, she was essentially the protagonist and she was a prostitute, you know, oh and, and tell the story <laughs> through her. And so combine that with the fact that all of these people claim heritage to these to the, to this family and i found this fascinating letter written by this woman marie velardi who claims to be a 10th great granddaughter of greet right <laughs> and i think really thoughtfully takes on the way that these historical sort of myths are passed down over time and right. seeks to kind of rescue um the story of greet and show that though she was portrayed as outspoken and fiery, which clearly she was, in the end, she lost control of her own narrative, right? She mm -hmm. lost control of her own story. 
and has become something that is probably so far beyond the human that she was 400 years ago. Everything that we know about her, or almost everything that we know about her, were things that were said by enemies or people that had yeah. something to gain from maligning her right. um, sort of reputation, which is something that happens to powerful women throughout history kind of over and over and over again. Um, so it is... Yeah, I mean, it's not a direct... It's like not a direct record, but like it makes me think about Monica Lewinsky. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Somebody who becomes an archetype created by the media, if you will. Right. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> whose story, whose life story then just gets away, you know, just away from her. I mean, there's so many differences between these two stories, but it's a great example of the way that you can lose yourself in that historic and that compelling historical narrative. Absolutely. How are we doing? So, um, should we turn to some of the questions? We have a then, lot Julie? of questions. Yeah, yeah, we should. I'm glad. It's great. It's always nice to see lots of questions because it means yeah. that people are really interested in this story. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's see. What did um, Peter Stuyvesant have to say about this land purchase? Um, Stuyvesant comes a bit later, right? So this was already established. Um, there was a bit of back and forth as the sort of. Um, the um, landlines between New York and Gravesend continue yeah. to be sort of adjusted into the 1650s and 60s, but um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't actually think that there was ever, you know, kind of I never found any, any attempt to take anything away. That's right. I've never found any any intervention in that land, nor any like direct um, address of it by uh, Peter Stuyvesant. That doesn't mean he did. It just means that we don't have any record of that. Right. Um, I think and, that, you know, again, like the, that, the fact that this was way far out, do you know what I mean? Right. Beyond the sort of the basic governance of the city would have made the disputes that were taking place in New Utrecht must, much less significant to somebody like Peter Stuyvesant than the disputes that were taking place along Wall Street, right? Yeah. Stuyvesant was certainly aware of them um, because he did have beef with, um, with Lady Moody, Moody. Um, yeah. and, and with the Quakers who she invited out kind of that way. He had a, a rather um, strict kind of um, adherence to sort of, you know, religious doctrine in the area, but it was incredibly um, distant for him. Um, the foundation yeah. that gave us the funding to acquire this is the Breslauer Foundation, B-R-E-S, L-A-U-E-R. And just thank you to them again. And they were so wonderful <laughs> to work with. Um, and you said it was um, it was a, a document sale at Christie's, right? It was that a document came up? sale at Christie's. And um, so one so sometimes a donor will make themselves known, and sometimes or the, the person who's selling, and sometimes they won't. And sometimes they will share details about the provenance of the materials that they are giving. Provenance is the history of how that uh, item was passed down. Mm -hmm. And sometimes okay. they don't. And in this case, they didn't. Um, but we worked, to, so Christie employs um, a significant number of art historians and artifact historians who do their own research to determine the veracity of this. We also did some of our own assessments on this um, and really felt very comfortable that this was a, a, an authentic document. Absolutely. Um, who had title to the land is another question. Um, a wonderfully complicated question. Yeah, um, I mean, Niall, you want to tackle this one? So the history of yeah. land ownership for the Americas. And that's why it's, uh, you know, especially for like, you know, because we're focused on such a, a narrow um, kind of geographical region, especially in the 17th century, um, it's complicated because no one officially owned anything, right? But when the Dutch came over, they did kind of ostensibly claim the whole of Long Island for themselves. The English followed that up as well. And there were kind of official land grants and then things that were happening on the ground as individuals moved onto Long Island. They were making their own kind of connections with indigenous communities and purchasing land. Um, it's very mixed. Um, it's a very mixed bag because um, the colonial government also didn't like people sort of making their own um, negotiated transactions with uh, the local communities because then that kind of calls into question exactly which land purchase is the official one. Um, so there was a lot of, of back and forth. 
Um, Someone asks about Spanish roots, and I think that that seems likely. It, mm -hmm. um, his, he was born in Cartagena, Spain, um, and if we look at a map of Europe, you can see the very close connections between southern Spain and Morocco, um, northern Africa. So I think this is sort of what um, historian Ira Berlin often calls sort of a Creole Atlantic culture, where there's a significant mixing of communities, races, ethnicities, languages. Um, and so there are very tight um, Spanish, Spanish connections uh, there. Um, so a couple people are asking some really interesting questions about what happened to um, the daughters of, um, of Vance Alley and Greed Rainers. Um, the answer is we don't know yet, or I don't know yet, because uh, we didn't get into that research. Um, and yeah. I think actually this is a fantastic thing for people with genealogical research experience to take up. Uh, it's a great time to re remind everybody that genealogy research is very, very different than historical <laughs> research. Um, right. So, um, it, and, and it takes like a real sort of micro focus and digging in and a, often a, a separate body of resources than what historians are often drawing on, though there are certainly relationships between the two and the two, um, the two fields are definitely connected. Um, so this is, so I, I think what we as an institution did is we did enough his, historical kind of context and research on this to set a foundation um, for future research that we hope that our, that, that the patrons of VHS and other institutions will sort of continue on beyond that. That's certainly the next step for sure. Um, has, has anyone attempted to look into Moroccan historical documents to find information about Anthony? That sounds awesome. They should. Um, I mean, and that's 17th century, particularly for these communities that are sort of circulating around the Atlantic. For us in the contemporary, sort of in the modern period, it's tough to do this research because materials are scattered all over the place. There are many different languages. So you really have to have a kind of very deep toolkit um, to get into this work. So I, I don't doubt at all that either someone has done this or is working on this or will work on this, yeah. but um, it takes a lot of um, kind of prep to be able to do it um, successfully. And uh, related to that, I see some great comments from uh, our colleague Joseph Dida at um, New York Historical Society. Mm. Hi. Um, and he also flags, I think, a very important, so one question that we've often sort of tackled and thought about is, what does it mean to be Muslim? Like, is it fair to just assume that um, Vestali was Muslim? Right. And this is why we come up with this kind of term like of, of Muslim origin, do you know? Um, because clearly mm -hmm. it was a part of his culture. One of the things that ties him, I would say, most to the idea of him continuing to practice or value that religion as part of his identity is that he, it, it, it is, it, it, some records show that he brought a Quran over with right. him um, to New Amsterdam when he arrived there in 1630. And there are records that show that that Quran, which was associated with him in the records, was auctioned off um, in the, I think, the mid 20th century, 1940s or 1950s. I did a lot of digging to try to track that those records down. I wasn't able to, so the deepest I was able to dig was to some genealogical literature that was from a secondary source. Would love to find out more about that. If anybody, yeah. if anybody knows, um, reach out to me on like, Twitter or at, at, at my NYPL email um, or to Nayeli. Um, but that is just, these are the sort of the tantalizing pieces of evidence that we have that we use to kind of make inferences, but so many of these questions are difficult to conclusively answer. Mm -hmm. Let's see what else is here. It's, it's such a tough a kind of like back and forth too, because as you mentioned, it's kind of like being steeped in a sort of cultural um, milieu and like spirituality and kind of, you know, what all that means that's so individual to any particular person so um you know we I can mean, only make our best inferences and that's right and these are these are issues of identity and self-identification that we continue to poke at today um even with um our oral history projects like um with the muslims in brooklyn project we interviewed a number of people who identified culturally as muslim but weren't necessarily practicing and i think for people who study religion and the practice of religion in that oral history collection, there are some really wonderful um, observations of people who move in and out of practice. 
right? Like mm-hmm. who move away from it and then come back to it and why they do, which I think is such a, a nuanced way of understanding the relationship between identity and religion. And I mean, not to come off of the land deed, but like why oral history is a, a remarkable source that complements many other kinds of sources. Right. What I wouldn't give to have an oral history with um, Greet and Anthony. <laughs> that would be incredible. Um, so there's um, kind of a, um, let's say maybe a workhorse question. There's a question about the land conveyance records that we have at BHS, um, which document the transfer of land um, throughout the region, um, going back to records in the 1600s. So. Um, these these land conveyance boxes that we have at BH, they were a WPA project, yes. right, Julie? Yes. Um, so, you know, like, cool um, <laughs> amazing, the kind yeah. of work that people could do with kind of dedicated time in the early 20th century is incredible. Um, but if, you know, folks are doing kind of land research, um, the land conveyance records at BHS are an incredible resource because they're incredibly detailed down to block and lock numbers. Um, individuals went through um, sort of city land records book by book by book and attract all this out um, by block. So you can really, you can, if you know your lot and block number, you can request your particular land conveyance box and it'll show you as far back as the official records go, who owned which land, when things were sold, how things were parsed and changed. Um, it's an incredibly detailed record. Yeah, so the important thing there is that it's not original documentation, it's right. records of records, right? But the right. beauty of that is that the people who kind of curated this brought together lots of different records um, different, different records of exchange uh, under uh, basically organizing them spatially, right? So if you know where you're looking, you can it, it right. aggreg- essentially somebody in the, in the 1930s aggregated them for you. Right. We did a lot of work with them um, on, the, on our research around the um, Empire Stores building. We we're actually able to trace back um, the land ownership around that area to the 1690s, and then also track where the landfill was built and when, um, all through this one block, block based box. Right. Um, let's see, maybe we'll end with this question. Can people get a copy of the deed? Well, I don't work at BHS anymore. Yeah. Well, I'll let you so answer do, that one. <laughs> we do um, provide um, uh, digitization um, and um, uh, photography services. You can find more information about that on our website. I know that page, um, one of the um, the last big things you did, Julie, before you transitioned over to NYPL was help us zhuzh up that page and kind of um, clarify stuff. So um, if people are interested in getting a digital copy of, of the deed or otherwise, you can certainly um, check out our website, um, which will direct you to where to email and sort of what that kind of um, service is going to is going to cost. And I will say beyond that, um, beyond just this deed, Nayeli mentioned that the New Netherland Institute in Albany has scanned all of the records related to the colony of New Amsterdam that are now word searchable, which is, as she mentioned, how we did a lot of the research on this topic. And so if you want to sort of dig in for yourself and look at the blow by blow back and forth from government records about this, this is something that anybody on this, on this, on this, uh, mm-hmm. this program can do. The uh, our deed, um, as you mentioned, Julie, is, is a copy or likely a, a receipt that was done a couple of years later, but the um, the wordage um, exists within the colonial records and is searchable mm-hmm. um, through okay. the, the Albany Institute. So um, uh, once we wrap up, this will be a, a recording and you can go back and look at the slides. And I, I did pop in the, the web address um, for the New York State Archives and where to start finding that work. Um, as, as much as it pains me. I think we should probably start wrapping it up here. Um, it's been lovely um, and it's wonderful to end Bite Size History with this artifact today, yeah, um, June 19th, which is Juneteenth. Um, it's really kismet in a way to have the chance to discuss a document that's helping us uncover um, a story of um, black colonial adversity and triumph on a day that is celebrating um, the end of slavery in America several centuries later. Um, This is just the beginning, Um, and at BHS we look forward to continuing to grow our collections and researching and sharing the histories of Brooklyn's diverse communities. Um, Today more than, excuse me, today more than ever, Black histories matter and Black lives matter. Um, 
this is our final Bite Size History of the summer. Um, and I just wanna say how lovely it's been to have um, everyone um, who has been watching with us and to hear from many of you. Um, we have been getting emails um, from folks from different um, you know, parts of the country. Um, and it's just wonderful to have this kind of digital connection to folks. Um, we'll still be here um, behind the scenes working away and, and we do invite you to continue connecting with us. Um, our finding, uh, excuse me, our Find Your Brooklyn Roots initiative um, continues throughout the summer. Um, if there are any uh, family historians or genealogists out there um, who have research questions or queries, um, please be in touch with us at the email that you see there on the screen. Um, just yesterday, um, we got an email from one of the individuals who's um, used the service who gave a big shout Shout out to um, Library Reference Associate Adrian Lang and the work that she has helped um, them do in sort of uncovering some of their Brooklyn past. So we look forward to working with more folks um, to help you find your Brooklyn roots. Um, it may be tough if it's questions going back to this sort of 17th century Dutch period, because as we mentioned, the language is tough, but um, any questions from then up until the um, sort of the more contemporary period, we look forward to talking to you about. Um, I want to give one final thank you to my partner in crime today, Dr. Julie Golia. Julie, it's been really <laughs> nice to sit and get the chance to chat with you more again. Same here. It's just been so much fun. I, I miss you and I miss I VHS. miss you too. <laughs> <laughs> and I miss my VHS, you know, my, my favorite pieces from the archives. So I love the opportunity to come back and talk about them. Um, one more time, um, thank you to all of you who have been spending your lunch times with us exploring Brooklyn and Long Island's history. Um, happy Juneteenth to everybody um, and take care and we're signing off for now, but um, check out our, our webpage to see what's next for us at VHS. Bye everyone.